like to introduce to you Dr. Tom Bullard. Tom is from the Desert Research Institute out of Nevada, and he has given this lecture for us a couple times. And I really like the way he uh, provides geology information because it's nice, basic overview that everyone I think can understand. Because geologists have a tendency to use language, a language that no one else can understand. It's like put it in words we can understand or define the term. So you're going to define words for us, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's give a warm welcome for that Dr. Okay, I think this might be on your uh, to-do list. Uh, it's in the back of your uh, training manual. And it's uh, all about structure of the earth. It's really down. It's really down to earth. Um, but probably what will, uh, as you go through the manual, and maybe, maybe this is where I might lose a lot of you. But if you go back and uh, reflect on what I'm talking about, it's it's basically uh, bits and pieces of this article, or this. Uh, yeah, it's a short. Overview by Ken Adams, one of my colleagues at uh, GRI, um, and it kind of kind of uh, covers pretty much all the stuff. There's some newer newer data out there that's just come out in the last couple of years um, that I didn't have the last time I gave this talk. I'm not really going to go into it, but we have some of that. So <clears throat> let's see here. Okay, so um, I'm a uh, just. A little bit of background uh, for those of you who don't know anything about the research institute. We're the nonprofit research arm of the University of Nevada system. We're soft money. We go out and hustle our own money um, to keep ourselves employed. It's been a challenge. Um, I'm a geomorphologist, and the soil geomorphologist um, is sort of what I do. That means I study the landscape, the landforms. Um, They're out there. I understand how they form, the processes, the forces governing, forces governing the processes that, that actually end up looking like something that you recognize. Uh, I have spent a lot of my time in the desert lately, so I don't claim to be the expert on Lake Tahoe. Um, but as a geologist, I can kind of say anything and be anybody I want to be. So. Where do I just aim it anywhere? And well, the thing is over here, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, what I thought I'd do is I kind of get us into the framework of where we're at, just besides being here at uh, one Pine Village, talk a little bit about the geology and tectonics, um, some of the faults um, uh, and the evidence for them, and that's been in the news recently in the last several years. Um, another great phenomenon is, is uh, McKinney Bay and the, the known as McKinney Bay Landslide Complex. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the ice ages and uh, some of the ancient shorelines. I'm not going to talk about lake levels. Um, I think that will be for somebody else to deal with. I'll talk about ancient lake levels, but not the since the gates went in. Since the gates went in, things have been pretty relatively stable. Okay, <clears throat> there are lots of uh, different ways we can talk about this from a geologic perspective. Uh, we can take the big picture. We're going to have to look a little bit about this uh, and some of the deep uh, internal forces that produce some different rock types and spectacular landforms. This is not like Tahoe. All right, we know that we can uh, talk about the glacial history um, of this basin because a lot of the topography we see, particularly on the west shore, um, reflects the glacial history. So here we go. Where are we? Well, here we are. This is a physiographic map of the United States. And you see Lake Tahoe is right on the edge of the uh, Great Basin. And this part is the Basin Range section and the Pacific Mountain System. And that has the Oregon Coast Ranges and then the California Coast Ranges plus the Sierra Nevada. So we're sitting right about there. Interesting place to be. Right at the edge of two major physiographic provinces. All sorts of things are happening here. And as we all know, the weather comes tearing through here uh, with, with great um, gusto. All right, if we um, talk about plate tectonics, and if, uh, for those of you who, who may not be all that familiar with uh, what plate tectonics refers to, um, 
again, the, the Dustin training manual has, has a nice little summary of this. But just think of the, uh, <clears throat> the outer rigid shell of the Earth, the outer the rigid crust of the Earth, is broken into uh, a number of solid, relatively speaking, plates and numerous little tiny, smaller microplates. And they kind of move around, um, driven by um, the internal heat engine of the Earth. Heat comes up from deep within and, and rises and pushes, makes new rock and pushes rock out of the way. And this is like a giant game of bumper cars, uh, where they run together, strange things happen, lots of fun things happen, and this is no exception. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about that plate boundary, but what I want to do is just sort of uh, also put this into perspective of, uh, has it always been like this? Well, common sense might tell you that no, it probably hasn't been like this all along. But if we look at um, Paleozoic time, a couple hundred to five, six hundred million years ago, uh, this is this is us, more or less, in this general area. Um, we were in like in an ocean. Here's a cross section uh, coming across a comet like this, and we would be out here out in this area. So these were big seas and so forth. Sierra Nevada didn't even, didn't even exist then. Fast forward uh, 80 to 100 million years or so again, and off of uh, North America, we have what's known as a subduction zone. This has happened several times uh, throughout Earth history on the western margin of what came to be modern North America. Subduction zone is where oceanic crust, if we think about the tectonic plates again, crust they're made up of is relatively light, buoyant, low density, um, granitic terrain, and the oceans are underlain by what are known as oceanic basalts, which is very dense, iron-rich uh, rock type. Uh, it's got a density of, uh, depends exactly where you're at, but four to five um, grams per cubic centimeter. Um, Whereas the uh, <coughs> crust is around 2.8, uh, somewhere in there. So it's you know, relatively speaking, one floats on top of the other. Well, as, as I told you, these, these plates are kind of being driven around and playing bumper cars, where you have two plates come together. Um, the heavier oceanic crust, when it bumps into the light continental crust, it'll sink beneath it. This is what we call a subduction zone. And as this slab sinks, the deeper it gets, the hotter it gets. Uh, all the forces, the pressures, uh, what we call the geothermal gradient, as you go down into the earth, how much it heats up. And it begins to melt, actually, um, in the slab. We call this thing the slab that goes under. It melts, and magma is produced and begins to rise and then puffs out as, as uh, volcanoes. If you go a little farther to the north, in the Cascades, we have active volcanism because we have a subduction zone there. Uh, you go around the Pacific, Pacific Rim, we call it the Rim of Fire, you see the same kind of thing. Um, and this, where we're at, a little different story. Um, so here's our, what we call the Sierra Nevada Baffolip is, is being in place. As this magma rises, it's also it's melting, the, the, it's kind of melting its way up. It's like hot probe in, in ice. It melts its way up. Um, and you develop a very uh, granitic rich body of rock there. And that uh, subsequently became the core of the Sierra Nevada. Subsequent to that, 20 or 30 million years ago, the subduction that was happening beneath California, south of uh, Cape Mendocino, it was happening, but there was a uh, a more buoyant mid-oceanic ridge that intersected that subduction zone. And when you have something that's hot and buoyant and it runs into something that's kind of buoyant in the first place, it's just a giant collision. So about 20, 30 million years ago, uh, we had this collision. There's no longer subduction. When that happens, it's like a car wreck. The forces begin to move in different directions. I haven't lost anybody yet. 
Um, so this is our modern day tectonic setting. It's a little skewed, so north is that way. Here's our star for the Lake Tahoe region. Um, don't pay too much attention to all these different things, Sierra Market Plate and all this and that. This is the Pacific Plate, this formerly subducted beneath the western margin of North America. Here's the fracture zone, this is what's known as the Gorda Plate and the Juan de Fuca Plate. These are subducting underneath the Oregon and uh, uh, Washington coast. We call it the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, and so we have active vol volcanism here. The volcanism through here is, uh, for the most part, ceased. The last kind of gasp, we're in, we're in Alaskan, uh, Shasta region. And then there's some, some younger things out here in the desert. So when we went from basically Pacific Plate going underneath North America like this, now it's it got stuck and it's still pushing, and so it's into a lateral sense of motion we call a strike slope. Yes. So the Sierra and microplate there is that uh, formerly ocean bottom, mostly sedimentary rock that's been kind of created on the. the uh, not, well, yeah. Well, you're asking us a tough question. <laughs> there's, there's not an easy answer for that one. Must be a geologist to use the word like created. Um, there is a created terrain here, there's no doubt about it. The coast ranges um, are, you can find subduction complex rocks within the coast ranges. Central Valley um, has got a lot of Cenozoic, younger, uh, even some upper Paleozoic, or Mesozoic, I'm sorry, Mesozoic and uh, Cenozoic rocks within the basin and fill there. So, um, but what's underneath that yeah, it's it's more crystalline, crystalline rock. So in a sense, yeah, this would probably probably would have been some kind of an oceanic at one point. When exactly? I'm, I'm not a California geologist, so I can't answer that one. Important thing about this new motion, and you've heard of the right lateral slip on the San Andreas Fault, is that. The stress field now has been totally reoriented, and what has resulted in is extension, or it's pulling apart in an east-west direction. Remember, north is kind of off this way. In an east-west direction across the Great Basin, and that has resulted in the formation of what's known as the basin and range. So we have ranges and basins, and they are um, bound by structural, structural elements called faults. In this case, there are normal faults on either side of a basin, and uh, the basin drops down, the mountains relatively rise up. I was going somewhere with that. Uh, that's okay. Um, Lake Tahoe sits right on the edge of this uh, structural zone. This is called the Walker Lane, or the Walker Lane Belt. And there's a series of stepping um, systems of what we call Horst and Graben. Horst is, is uh, basically the high mountain range is a Graben, it's a German for a grave or, or deep hole. Um, these, and they're called, we call them extensional because the, the forces that form them are pulling the crust apart. Lake Tahoe sits right in one of these extensional features, the extensional uh, structure. Earthquakes? Sure. Uh, red ones are big earthquakes. These are historic ones, 1852, uh, only up to 2005, so we've, we've missed uh, on here all the big swarms from a couple of years ago uh, on the north side of Tahoe. Um, but some of them are big. Uh, we've had some great big ones in Nevada, seven, magnitude seven down here, uh, um, you know, Southern California, this is getting down to the Mon Mono Mammoth area. What's that? I was going to say, is that Bakersfield? Actually, no, that's probably Bishop, um, Lone Pine, that area. 1870 something or other, big earthquake there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this, not too much, because I don't know. I don't think you need to frighten people, but if they say, well, is there going to be an earthquake up here? Um, yeah, someday. <laughs> when? Who knows? Um, 
The probability is relatively low, but it's like anything else. The probability of having traffic accidents, you know, relatively low, but you know, it could happen any day. So, um, speaking of, of earthquakes, let me go back to what a fault is. A fault is just a, a, a planar discontinuity or break in the Earth's crust along which sub, sub, substantial displacement uh, has, has occurred. So imagine between my hands is a fault, uh, a normal fault would have a slight incline to the fault plane and one side would go down, the other side would go up. A reverse fault is just the opposite on the same thing. And if it's a horizontal slip along a vertical plane like this, we just call it strike slip. These are uh, normal faults in, in Lake Tahoe and these black lines, uh, the guys in the front. Folks in the front can see these. Um, there are lots of them, there's no doubt about it. And, oh, it's only been the last few decades that uh, a lot of interest has been placed on what we call paleoseismology, or earthquake geology, trying to understand earthquake history from, from faults. Um, and in the last five to ten years, in fact, in the last five years, we've got a whole lot of raft of new information, new techniques and methods uh, that allow us to actually determine how much movement has occurred on, along these faults. So, uh, we talked about rocks. If we look at the north end of, of Lake Tahoe, um, most of these rocks up here are tertiary age um, and quaternary, the last two and a half million uh, years. Um, tertiary goes back to the, uh, so it's everything since the end of the Cretaceous, so um, 80, 60, 80 million years or so ago. Um, Quaternary is the last two and a half million. These are volcanic rocks, mostly up in the north side. We have Cretaceous um, and, and tertiary granitic rocks. This is part of the Sierra Nevada batholith I showed you earlier. So there's kind of pink and some of the brown stuff is more of the granitic rocks. These are uh, granitics up here too, closer to Incline Village. <coughs> get another one up there? Yeah. Um, down here, um, in this region, south, southwest part, uh, we have more uh, older rocks, isolated uh, metamorphics. Uh, I won't, I'm not going to talk about what a roof pendant is, but uh, that can be a Q&A. We have quaternary glacial and cluster deposits along the south shore and uh, a lot of the, um, the west shore. It's, it's a lot of this yellow stuff mostly close to the shore and extending back into the, into the mountain range. You see these linear, kind of linear valleys. These are all glacial valleys. We'll talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about a lot of stuff in a minute. Um, okay, so let's just talk about the uh, north end of Lake Tahoe because that's where we're at. Oops. There we go. Okay, so here are uh, the tertiary and quaternary age volcanic rocks. Some of these are, uh, you know, they're older than this, but there's some that are quite young, million, million four or so. We're over here. This is a thing called the, uh, uh, well, they call it the North Tahoe Fault. I think it's not the Incline Village Fault. <laughs> <laughs> Came just at the right time. <laughs> um, this is this is known as the uh, West Tahoe Fault, do West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault because it shows up at Dollar Point. And you see all these little, uh, it looks like the little splays are like a horsetail. Um, extending onshore in the area of uh, uh, North Lake Tahoe, um, possibly a cause for concern. Um, it's to the east of there, but uh, it's still up in this area. These are granites. So here's the, uh, here's the Dollar Point Fault, and here's uh, the Incline Village Fault. Okay, we're here, and here's the Incline Village Fault. It goes right through the, right, uh, almost through the school. Uh, if you go over there, you can actually see the fault scarf, yeah. So are most of these faults kind of surface cracking as a result of this kind of shearing force that's happening, or are we still seeing Yeah, there's some shearing going, uh, 
there is some sharing going on. When we talk about share, a lot of times that's more of a um, more of a strike slope kind of mm -hmm. phenomenon. But yeah, there's you know, sharing of the rocks and kind of move them. Um, these are normal faults, largely. And yes, it has to do with the extension, mm -hmm. among other things. Okay, uh, on the west side, as I alluded to just a few minutes ago, it's a very um, complex uh, system of faults. The, uh, the, the, the Tahoe Sierra Frontal Fault System is this whole, basically this whole mess. Geologists, particularly earthquake geologists, love to put names on things. Um, you kind of have to, because otherwise, what are you going to say? Well, that's it's the fault that's over there by the moraine, that's by the tree. That, so they put names on them. Um, but this is the, the kind of one of the biggies that everybody's kind of concerned with, the West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault, um, and then the Incline Village Fault, which is just off the, off the screen here. There's been a fair amount of information that recently has come out of following the Lake uh, work uh, that John Kleppe has is, is kind of been a driving force behind. They have some rather spectacular bathymetry of the lake. Uh, there are glacial moraines. We'll show you in a few minutes what a glacial moraine is that are displaced by these faults. If you know how old the glacial moraine is, then you can, you can say something about uh, how recently the fault occurred, or the displacement on the fault, as well as the, the amount. Um, so it's a very complex zone. Some of these are capable of generating large earthquakes, according to very recent publications that just came out in the last year or so. Um, I alluded to some of the new techniques that are available. Um, LIDAR, this is a, a laser uh, or light and distance uh, analyzing radar. It's a, this is a, this is a three panels of the same thing. This is fully vegetated, this is um, uh, black and white color, and this is a LIDAR where it basically strips all the vegetation off and you can see everything that's, that's hidden underneath there. And then here is at the bottom is, is a picture, um, so close I can't even see this, but this is Cascade Lake, Emerald Bay. And these white lines that go across here are traces of faults that they're now able to, to map. And, um, uh, then they go out in the field and you actually measure uh, the displacement from one side to the other of this fault and come up with what we call slip rates, how much this thing is actually moving. Uh, more evidence of uh, active faulting in the area. Uh, here's the West Tahoe Fault, um, West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault. And what this is, uh, this is some submarine or sub, submarine, this isn't marine, but it's, um, uh, I think this is the chirp data. It's basically just uh, sonar that bounces, goes down, and bounces off the bottom. And it, uh, it bounces off all these, these uh, different layers of what these represent uh, lake beds. So sediment deposits within the lake bed. And so the sonar goes down and reflects off these um, lake beds, bounce back to the surface, and they process it and come up with a picture like this. Well, here's the state line fall uh, down in the south end, south end of the lake. And uh, here's the McKinney Bay debris complex. Uh, so these two green lines represent a formerly continuous surface that now is displaced. So this is um, one way to get at the amount of vertical displacement across this, this fault. In this case, it's about 21 meters. This is from uh, Graham Kent and others, 2005. He's been up here to talk quite a few times, so I don't need to belabor that point. Uh, I mentioned I talked about the McKinney Bay uh, landslide complex. This is a um, here's McKinney Bay, and you see this kind of all this jumble of these stuff here um, out on the lake floor. So this is this is again this is a bathymetric, a nice uh, digital model, not so much a model, but it's been put together from all the sonar images and so forth. Here's the shoreline, and this is the sub uh, aqueous representation, so the purple is really deep stuff, the yellow is plus deep. So all these things that are sticking up here are pieces of this landslide mass. Um, we don't really know when it happened. 
Some people have written that it's about 60,000 years ago. Some say it's around 300,000 years ago. I don't know what the latest is. But this is based on the amount of sediment that's been deposited on top of these blocks. It's like uh, 15, 25 meters of sediment. This fine grain stuff is mostly very fine grain. Sitting on top of these blocks, they ran down a, a tube and took what's known as a piston core. You drive a pipe into the uh, sediment and you pull it up, it creates a little suction and pulls the whole thing up. They got about six meters of sediment. Um, that, I think they had some datable, uh, I think they had datable material in there, but based on sedimentation rates, you can extrapolate um, how old that might be, how, how long it took to accumulate that amount of sediment. If you know it accumulates at a rate of X number of millimeters per year, and you have six, ten meters of it, then you just do the quite quick calculation, figure out how old this thing is. So it happened quite a while ago. Uh, if there's anybody around time. There's another close-up of these blocks. Uh, I can't, I don't remember how big they are. Some of these things are huge. Do you remember, Heather? Um, big, I want to say. Big. House yeah, size. 20 stories. 20 stories, something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're, they're monstrous. And they're not only out in the lake, they're almost all the way across. You can see little pieces that are all the way, almost to the east shore. So this thing must have made a big, rather large impression um, on the landscape. Just that volume of material falling into the water um, would be this kind of the same effect as an earthquake. Uh, you can't really say it would be like the Japanese earthquake um, at Fukushima, but same kind of effect, except here, in the case of one that's happening on the other side of the Pacific, you basically have one big wave that kind of makes its way across the, the ocean. Here, the water has nowhere to go except from one side to the other. It's kind of like a bathtub. So if you pound it on your bathtub or drop something in your bathtub, the water's going to go back and forth. We call that a sash, sash effect. And uh, models have said that um, if estimates are correct on, say, the uh, West Tahoe Fault, uh, West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault, some are saying that you can, manage, you can generate a magnitude 7 off that and create a sash of about 10 meters. So um, then it's just figure out, okay, what's 10 meters above lake level? Where do I, where do I need to be? So if you're, if you're here, you might be okay. I'm not sure how far above the lake are we. No, he's going to be a little bit. I'm going higher. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a big earthquake. You might want to think, well, maybe I should... <laughs> You know, for high ground. At the director's party spot. Is there mm -hmm. evidence that that sage actually impacted the north and south ends, or was the impact mostly on the east and west? Um, I, you know, I uh, I don't think anybody's answered that question yet. So there was a there's the computer model um, that you'll see in the movie Lake Tahoe in depth, where there's an animation of the estimated movement of the water, and so you can watch it in 3D. Later, but so the but it's based on a computer model. So, yeah. uh, people have looked for deposits, what, what, similar to what we would look for in tsunami. When a tsunami ha happens on the coast, you get debris and all sorts of stuff that goes way inland, and uh, lagoons, um, estuaries are really good places to to look for tsunami deposits because. Suddenly you're transporting stuff like sand into an environment that's mostly silts and clays. And when you, when you uh, put a core down into an estuary or a lagoon, you pull it up and you have all these fine sediments and then a layer of clean sand, no, nothing growing in it, no organisms, nothing. And then more fine sitting on top of that. It's a good chance that the sand represents some big event. Could be a flood or it could be Tsunami, depending on a lot depends where you're at, how you make your interpretation. So those kind of things should be here somewhere. People have looked down towards the gravel pit uh, south of here. There's a big barrel pit. Um, I haven't had a chance to go in there and look around yet, but there might be something out there. There, there is a paper on cobble dunes that are um, perpendicular to the coast off Tom City. 
Huh. And yeah. as I remember, it's been a few years, but as I remember, they were saying that, that could, they, those could have been created by the sage. And the fact that they were cobbled in rather than sand yeah. ones meant that there was an awful lot of energy. Yes, yeah. the there would be a tremendous amount of energy. Yeah. Um, Philip here just asking all sorts of questions. Sorry, sorry. this is my only <laughs> geologist in the group. Uh, so, are there other uh, landslides of similar magnitude that created a similar debris discharge um, that we could compare on land? Um, this is the only one that, I mean, there's so uh, much there's, debris in that I mean, water. Yeah, there's, there's been, uh, well, if you go up to uh, Yellowstone, West Yellowstone in 1957 or so, there was a very large earthquake up there. And uh, if any of you are familiar with, with that part, West Yellowstone is what's known as uh, uh, Hebgen Lake or Earthquake Lake. And a big chunk of the, the mountainside slid and basically covered up the valley. The Grovant slide, which you can see from Jackson, uh, I think, um, is no, well, actually not from Jackson, but from north of Jackson. You look back and you see this thing. It's a monstrous, monstrous slide. So yeah, there, there, there are um, other examples. There's, there was the Viant Dam um, disaster in Italy in the 60s, I think, when uh, a huge chunk of the mountainside went into a reservoir. Um, displaced so much water it overtopped the dam and took out villages downstream. So yeah, there's there are, there are things to compare it to. Got to feel like the doomsday guy. <laughs> Sorry. All right, well, let's uh, let's go on to something. I, I don't know, this seems to be a lot happier. Um, <laughs> ice ages, you know. I need a picture of a mastodon or something running around here. Nice shot, Emerald Bay. Um, and uh, snow-covered Sierra. One thing to notice about these is all these little tiny peaks sticking up, and they're all pretty close to the same elevation. And you come down, there are a lot of ridges kind of at the same elevation. Um, you might be able to pick out these U-shaped valleys for those of you that go down to Yosemite and so forth. That's the classic uh, Sierra and glaciation. And up and down the, the, the eastern edge of the Sierra, you get down to you know Mammoth <coughs> Lakes and uh, June Lake, Convict Lake, Bridgeport. Uh, you see these beautiful U-shaped glaciers, very much looks like Europe. Um, they were once occupied by ice. Well, in the Tahoe area, we've had um, three major glaciations. Within each of these, there are probably uh, many other little advances and, and uh, contractions. Uh, the oldest one, 400,000 to, you know, this is question mark, 600,000. It's, it, it's really hard to, to get a grip on what the age of this thing, thing is. The Tahoe, we've got a little bit better information on this, but um, that's because new uh, techniques for dating uh, the surface exposure age of rocks, in other words, boulders that are residing in moraines. Um, these numbers are a little bit better, but also, this could reflect that there were this uh, range of ages for the Tahoe, 65,000, 140,000 years. But there are, there is number one climate change and there are multiple glaciations. And then the youngest one, the Tioga, happened at what we call the um, uh, last glacial maximum, the LGM. And this is uh, 15,000, 25,000 years ago, right at the end of the Pleistocene. Uh, so sea level was way down, and the earth was covered with a lot of ice. Just, uh, just bringing up to speed on some glacial line forms. Um, here are a couple of nice, really nice pictures, and then here's some cartoons uh, showing about the same thing. But um, when you have uh, basically an ice cap or really thick ice, all the little tiny uh, bits and pieces are sticking up above it. And when the ice uh, goes away, we're left with these sharp peaks called horns. Um, moraines, where two glaciers come together, like this one right here, and this valley glacier, where the, uh, it's carrying debris along the edges of the uh, glacier. It's like a bulldozer. Imagine a bulldozer just moving down the valley. Well, it's pushing stuff forward, but stuff is also dripping over the sides of the, of the blade. And 
even when you see the guys grade the roads out here, what's left behind is always that long trail of, of positive relief that you try to drive through and wreck your car. Um, and the, it was kind of a weird analogy, but what we got on a glacier is the same, same effect and we call those lateral moraines. Where two glaciers come together, they used to have a lateral moraine on either side, and when they come together, all of a sudden you've got a common one right in the middle. We call that medial, medial moraine. So here's a, oh, let's see what color I'd make these, green, you can't even see it. This black thing looks so nice and inviting. Is a medial moraine. So somewhere up, up valley, there are two valley glaciers that came together. And then this is a representation on this cartoon. Same thing right here. Uh, glaciers can block other drainages and create little lakes. They can dam up drainages. And that is important in Lake Tahoe. So Tahoe, uh, what you see around here mostly, what people will be, particularly around Emerald Bay, um, you're looking at lateral moraines. And I mentioned uh, when just the little peaks are sticking up. Um, okay, here's Lake Tahoe. And this is, was the Sierra Ice Cap. And probably several times during Quaternary, this could be a million or more years old, when we had glaciations, where very large uh, parts of the Sierra were completely covered with ice except for the little tiny pieces uh, of the range that stuck up. Uh, Mount Talak is one of those. You know, this scale you can't show everything. Um, but if uh, sometime you're driving down I-80, um, I don't know, let's see, I'm trying to think of where it would be. Um, well, just about anywhere on the other side of Donner Summit, even at Donner Summit, if you get out and you find a good exposure to bedrock, you can actually see striations or grooves in the rock that uh, give you an indication of the direction, at least the uh, linear direction that the ice is moving. If you go up above Cascade Lake, um, not heading towards Bayview, but heading towards the um, Cascade Falls, that whole granite rock, uh, granite block has tons of the glacial striations. Uh, They're everywhere. Yeah. That whole zone. If you go into, if, you know, if you go into Yosemite, Tuolumne uh, Meadows, they're spectacular. And the glacial erratic, the glacial erratic is nothing more than a, a chunk of rock and debris that was carried in the ice, and then when the ice melted, it just basically drops and stays in place. And you see these beautiful polished surfaces of granite with these gargantuan boulders just sitting there. Uh, you know, everybody scratches, oh, I wonder who carried those here. <laughs> So that was a Sierra Ice Cap, and that you know that was quite a while ago. Um, so here's here's kind of a, a picture of you know colored white, what it looked like in the Lake Tahoe area. Here's a, a Squaw Creek and Bear Creek. These would have been the glaciers coming out of Squaw Valley and Bear Valley. And so this is the Truckee River coming down here. And interestingly enough, they did, in fact, uh, there's evidence to show support the fact that these glaciers came. Across the Truckee and, and created a dam, um, which blocked the outlet of Lake Tahoe and resulted in actually raising the lake of Lake Tahoe. I think right now the I'm going to do this metric. I can't convert to English right now, but um, outlet is I think 1897, and during the Tahoe glaciation it went up to 1927 meters, 1,927 meters. We got a picture here. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, you can see uh, this side. You can see a lot easier. Um, these the red lines, the yellow lines, and the green lines and the blue lines. 1897 this is a controlled out access outlet here at the uh, North Lake Tahoe. Uh, 1908 is, is kind of a high stand during Tioga. Uh, 1926 would be during the Tahoe glaciation. This is one that's uh, 70, 80, 100,000 years old. Um, and Tioga is you know, 15 to 20, 25,000 years old. And then this is a Donner Lake. Now I know this is, this is uh, I know that there, these uh, shorelines are true uh, for a number of reasons, and I've actually seen some of these. Um, you go up uh, near the airport along the, the river here, you can actually see lake, lake sediments. 
in little tiny things are just a millimeter or so thick of black and white, dark, dark light, dark light, dark light, very fine sediment. And that's what happens in lakes and particularly uh, some glacial lakes and so forth. These are annual, we call them bars. They're just thin laminations that, because of seasonal variations in temperature and organic debris and matter that's coming into the lake and settling out. You can count these things up, little couplets, and figure out how old they are. Well, those things were, we were looking at stuff, we were looking at things that were um, up here at this 1908. So there's, we're uh, 11 meters, 35 feet above modern lake, in thick packages of, of uh, lake sediments. I mentioned that the Truckee uh, River was dammed uh, by ice um, coming out of Barron Squaw Creeks. And and uh, there are, there's some little evidence of, of, of this here. What's really interesting is, and you've probably heard of, uh, from, through National Geographic or Discovery Channel, these things in uh, uh, Iceland called Juckalups. And uh, these are basically ice dams that, that suddenly break. Lake Missoula, which, which had a great hand in forming the channel scab lands along the Columbia River was an ice dam, monstrous ice dam lake that just gave way. Um, same thing happened here because as you go down the Truckee River, you will see huge trains of boulders. Trains that are just, uh, it's another word for it, just long lines of large boulders. Some of these are approaching the size of houses and so forth that have their origin up in um, Squaw and Bear Creek. We know that because the rock type is different from what everything else around it. Strangely enough, down in um, Reno and just west of Reno and Verdi, I read the post office here over there, there are what we call glacial erratics. There are rocks, boulders, the size of Winnebago's, um, that the nearest rock source is, is up close to Donner Pass. So these things had, and you can't, there's not water fast enough to move this stuff. So it had to be carried um, down on blocks of ice during one of these outbursts. Even as you go downstream from Reno um, into the canyon, heading out towards Mustang, there are big boulder fields of rocks of a, cons uh, a makeup that come a long, 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 long ways away. And they're too big to really be transported by even a great flood. We try to calculate the shear stress and the, you know, the, the numbers are monstrous. You know, water doesn't flow that fast, it vaporizes. So these had to be carried on a raft of some form or another. What was strange is that during that time, the whole trucking nose was almost like a lake. So these things had to go across the lake and down the river. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to show just a couple shots of, of, uh, of evidence uh, for uh, higher lake lines, uh, lake stands. Just while I have this up here, this is a perfect, nice little map. This is what this is a geologic map. The colors represent different age um, rocks. This yellow stuff is all what we would consider quaternary age. So it's less than two million years. Most of this is less than a few hundred thousand. Fallen leaf lake, and you see, I almost see a concentric uh, coloration here. Light yellow, dark yellow. The dark yellow is older, uh, glacial moraines. The light color is younger. And you see this kind of close right here at the end of Fallen Leaf Lake, and here's uh, Cascade Lake, the same thing. These are terminal moraines, and they've basically created a nice little lake basin. Here's our uh, West Tahoe Fault going through Fallen Leaf Lake, that's a no-brainer now. Cuts across here at this time of this map, uh, the scale, it doesn't show. Um, so I'm just gonna show you just a couple things for evidence here. Here's a, uh, God, so close. Um, what are mapped down here uh, are beach ridges. This is along the south shore, um, southeast shore, Lake Tahoe, at uh, 1,902 meters. So we're five to eight so meters above uh, current uh, lake level. Over here, uh, Cascade Lake, Emerald Bay. Um, here are the moraines. And these have what are called wave cut terraces. 
on these on these moraines at consistent elevations. Um, you can just um, select bathtub rings. And so these are representing high stands of Lake Tahoe, well above the outlet today. So there was something, those ice dams coming out of Bear and Squaw Creek that that allowed the lake levels to rise. Um, okay, also besides just mapping these uh, topographic features, uh, we can look at the sediments here. This is here at Sugar Pine Point. Um, here we have some clays overlain by uh, glacial till, with this big rock here. And then uh, this deposit up here uh, is interpreted as, as beach sands. So these are lake, deeper lake sediments, glacial deposits, and then um, beach sands. So, so we, the only way you can really do that is to, to raise the lake level. Here's another spot at uh, Ward Creek. You see these little, uh, look like faint lines, kind of inclined like this. These, this is what we call bedding. And this is the front of a delta. So a delta, it's a very special kind of delta it forms when uh, a stream comes into a standing body of water. And the way the sediment uh, comes to rest or settles out of the flowing water into the lake will form on the front edge of the delta. It will form these little slopes and just keeps adding to it. Within that is a, uh, a tephra of volcanic ash. Um, it's somewhere between 23,000 and 27,000 years old. And this is, this is, again, this is, you know, 5 to well, 1908, 10 to 10 or so meters above the, the modern outlet. Here's uh, Baldwin Beach, uh, 1995, modern beach ridge. We find beach ridges up here at, at higher elevations. So this is, these are older. Um, I'm not sure we know how old they are, but they're, they're definitely older, representing higher lake settings. It's also been lower. It's also been a lot lower as everybody, I'm sure you all know that. Um, this is 2002, right at the outlet. In fact, it was almost so low that water wasn't coming out of the lake. So if any of you were here and went up there and walked around, you could actually walk across the, the, the outlet. Um, well, you know, it's been a lot lower. Here's a, uh, a tree found at Baldwin Beach about 5,300 years um, old. Uh, how deep is this? <coughs> Less, it's well, like it's, it's 20 or 30 part. feet. Yeah. yeah. It's not real, it's not super deep, but it's deep enough. Mm -hmm. um, in a fallen leaf lake, uh, there are trees that have been interpreted to be in growth position. People, are, there are some people that will argue with that, that now these, these trees just, they fell stumped down and that's the way they, you know, they floated the sack and the, the root ball carried them down like that when the sediment is deposited around them. Others say, no, 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 they're, they're in a growth position. Anyway, the story there is uh, these things are in, I guess, over 100 feet deep water. Um, John Kleppen has a uh, paper in Journal of Nevada Water Association um, talks about this. But, um, so these, these trees that fall in the lake were grown above water on dry ground or moist ground, uh, between this period, 850 to 1150 AD. So, 800,000 years ago. Um, but we also know it died around 1200 AD, so the water came back up and submerged it. Water went down again because the tops of these things were rotted off, and then the water, then the lake level went back up again. This is in fall, fall in the leaf lake. So there's been fluctuation. The interpretation there is that, that when the lake level fell, you had the upper parts of the tree limbs were sticking up and they rotted. And, uh, and you know, I guess you only get the kind of rot in the, in the reservoirs and so forth that are fluctuating. Okay, here we go. Um, well, this one was just kind of left in is, is uh, how we're interpreting um, faults and so forth. This, this, uh, see, you might be able to see this kind of linear looking feature. It looks a little darker right there. Um, there's a little change, change in elevation across, coming across the topography goes kind of like this. And 
some people have interpreted that to be a fault. Um, but there are other alternative um, explanations, just during a lower stand of Lake Tahoe, the stream could have cut that. So just because you have a linear break in the surface isn't always an indication of fault. You've got to kind of put all the little pieces together to arrive at interpretation. So here we go. Um, Lake Tahoe's in a structural basin, one of these big grabbins, defined by active faults. Um, we've got tertiary volcanic and quaternary rocks at the uh, north end of the basin. Probably uh, played a role in the lake formation because we know there are basalt flows that are about two million years old or so sitting on top of earliest known lake sediments. So that probably created the outlet, dammed the outlet, and a lot of Lake Tahoe began filling up. And do I have another one? I push the right button. Yeah. And we had a glacial damming causing lake level to rise well above what it is today. Um, drops up and down lake levels. So it goes uh, is well below the natural outlet. So I think that's it. I've gone over my lot of time. I'm down a little bit. Question back there? What caused the big rocks on the east shore and how old are those uh, gigantic rocks? Which rocks are those? Along the east shore over uh, San Harbor or Dallas Campus. Well, uh, some of those, yeah, um, some of those are, is a natural weathering phenomenon of granite, what's called spheroidal weathering. And a lot of it has to do with the composition of, of this granitic rock. It's a very coarse, crystalline rock. Now, if you, uh, you guys, uh, most of you live up here somewhere, or you've heard the term DG, or yeah. disintegrated granite. <laughs> if you pick up a handful of that and look at it carefully, you'll see, well, there's some kind of really clear stuff, and then there's some kind of little whiter stuff, or pinkish. And there's a little flex of black in this net. And then you take that and you go over and look at one of these big boulders. By golly, it's the same stuff. It's disintegrated granite or uh, grust is, is the term that, that I was brought up on. Because granite is a very coarse crystalline rock and the, the uh, conditions under which it was formed. This is one of the last rocks, igneous rocks, to form from a melt, in terms of temperature and pressure. So it's closest, you know, when you think about it, it's closest to um, kind of its formation equilibrium. And so it's going to be one of the first ones to start falling apart. The fact that it's coarse grain helps. So you're attacking the mineral grains, and they begin to uh, break down. You know, you can sometimes in some of these rocks, you can just almost, you take your fingers almost, but usually a rock hammer and just knock off chunks of DG. Well, as, as granite weathers, it tends to, to form these rounded surfaces. Now, my guess is that's what we're talking about. Um, there could be some, some, you know, there could be pieces of old landslide or rock falls that came to rest and now have weathered uh, in place and have taken on that. That appearance. Another question. Well, it's actually very similar because I've noticed those rocks to it, and a lot of them look like they have a vertical break. And I don't know if that's just like a water going in there and freezing, or I don't know how that happens. Well, it's a, a good point um, because you've touched on two things. One, when um, these rocks in the Sierra Nevada form at great depths below the surface of the earth, we're talking. 10, 15, 20 kilometers depth. So they're under enormous pressure. Now as, as what we call it unroofing, or as erosion has taken place and you have different density crusts and so forth, the Sierra Nevada are actually still coming up. They're still rising. But erosion is kind of keeping it in check. So it's, you know, if we went into a very dry phase, for millions of years, we might have a lot bigger mountains. We went into a very wet phase. Um, we probably erode them faster than go up. Uh, but anyway, you're under huge pressure. 
as that pressure is released, there are all sorts of fractures that, that occur within the rock. And those fractures, a lot of times, are vertical and oriented um, to each other in, in a direction that represents the stress field under which, which they were formed. Um, so you can, yes, you can have vertical ones. Then, that's a great point of attack for water. So while we're in the summertime, it's great. Water goes in there, you got plants that are growing, uh, organic acids which attack the mineral bonds and break things apart. And in the, in the uh, cold season, particularly in, in the fall and the spring, when you have uh, a lot of cyclic freezing and thaw, put water in these little micro cracks and so forth, and the amount of force that water generates when it expands, when it freezes, is enough to actually break rock apart. And you've probably driven down the highway on a spring day and, and see rocks tumbling down. Off. Well, those are rocks that have fractured, but they've been held together by, by the ice. And then when it melts, the gravity takes over and they fall down. But that's a very good point. Water gets into those things and attacks it from chemical and physical processes. Gold star. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All thank right. you so much. That yeah, thank you. Memorize what you're in Yeah, good. But um, I did want to point to in additional resources, pages 24 to 52 is sort of that broad overview that uh, Tom was talking about. And then in the exhibit section, the second section of the Thomas J. Long Foundation, pages 59 to 62 is the super short version of just like the 12 main points that we talk about. And we really only focus on the three major faults, which are the West Tahoe that goes up through Duller Hill, um, and then the State Line Fault, which goes right at the Nevada State Line on the North Shore, and the Incline Fault. 